Djokovic is back. After not being allowed to compete in Australia and United States because of politics, the world number one returned to action in Monte Carlo, Belgrade and Madrid. As always, Djokovic's presence re-energized both his fans as well as his enemies in the corrupt tennis establishment and the media. The longest reigning number one in history had to battle illness and challenging opponents, answer questions about war and Wimbledon ban of Russian and Belarusian players, as well as endure brand new smear campaigns on behalf of the shameless mainstream media hacks. Here are the three most important things we learned from Djokovic's return. Number one. Djokovic continues to fearlessly stand by his principles and speak his mind. After refusing to be blackmailed into getting a Covid injection and stating that sacrificing his career is a price that he is willing to pay for the principle of body autonomy, Djokovic is now standing up against discrimination towards his fellow players. The lords who rule England, who became lords by colonizing the entire world, banned Russian and Belarusian players from playing in Wimbledon. Because they always wanted to, and now they have an excuse. And Djokovic, as always, stood up for his fellow players and disagreed with this decision. What makes his stance especially admirable is that Djokovic would benefit from the absence of these players, as his path to another Wimbledon title and more weeks at number one would be easier without the likes of Medvedev and Rublev in the draw. But this is not the first time that Djokovic puts principles and the well-being of his colleagues before his own self-interest which cannot be said about the two supposed ambassadors of tennis, Feather and Nadal. And if you think it's their right to keep quiet and mind their own business, let me remind you that both of those guys are on the ATP Players Council and it's their responsibility to fight for players' rights. For weeks, nobody in the press asked Feather and Nadal to make a statement about the situation because the prostitutes were too busy criticizing Novak for his position. Even though many other high-profile players and pundits also came out against Wimbledon's decision, the media hyenas only criticized Novak. To this day, Feather still hasn't said anything. He only makes public statements when he's trying to sell something, like promoting the Labor Cup, which his company owns. And earlier this week, Nadal finally came out of hiding and repeated what Djokovic said weeks ago because the coward figured out that this is the popular opinion. And the media? They published headlines that Djokovic agrees with him and not the other way around. Like it's Nadal who bravely leads and Novak just follows. Which brings us to number two. Mainstream tennis media is fake news. Western media never treated Djokovic fairly, but since the beginning of this year, they escalated their propaganda to an unprecedented level. A recent Sports Illustrated article said, quote, After arriving in Melbourne, his visa was revoked following the revelation that he provided false information on immigration forms. End quote. This is of course a blatant lie, and when some readers complained, Sports Illustrated removed this lie from the article. But they still didn't state the real reason why Novak was deported, which was purely political. Instead, they continued to talk about the wrong checkmark on his immigration form, which Australian courts said was completely irrelevant to the case. And similarly, Reuters was also caught lying about the deportation case. Since the scandalous Australian Open, Djokovic gained almost a million followers on his social media accounts, his practices draw more crowds than many tennis matches, and everywhere he plays, he receives more support than ever. But the media attack dogs continue to push the fake narrative that he is unpopular. After receiving wonderful support from the Monte Carlo fans, one reporter asked him if he was disappointed and surprised that the crowd was against him. Novak called his bluff and replied, actually, the crowd was very nice and it was a good reception. But the most malicious attack came from a pathetic excuse for a human being who posted on his Twitter account that Novak threw his racket at a ball boy in the Belgrade Open final against Rublev. If Djokovic really threw the racket on purpose, you would expect one of the many reporters who were there to make a huge deal out of it, like they always do. But they didn't. And an image has since surfaced showing that Novak simply lost his grip. Rottenberger deleted his tweet, but as always, by the time the truth came out, the fake news media had the headlines that they wanted and they gladly ran with them. This is a perfect example of how they create fake news. In the meantime, while the media poodles keep barking, 
Despite not being allowed to play in Australia or United States, on April 4th, Djokovic reached an incredible mark of 364 weeks at number one. That is more than seven calendar years as number one, maybe the biggest record in the history of tennis. After all, Federer called being number one the ultimate achievement. The ATP commemorated this incredible milestone by completely ignoring it. And here are the Twitter accounts of the four major tournaments. An image is worth a thousand words. We could spend hours going over all the examples, but you get the picture. The establishment and their media lapdogs are running a propaganda campaign against Djokovic. You will struggle to find any positive report about him while they criticize and attack him for anything that he says or does. And while more and more people are seeing through their lies, there is no question that the tennis establishment has successfully derailed Novak's career. Which brings us to the third thing we learned from Novak's comeback. He is far from his best form. Since the beginning of the year, Djokovic has played in only four events. In Dubai, he lost in the quarterfinal. In Monte Carlo, he lost in his first match. In Belgrade, he reached the final with much difficulty and physical struggle. And only in Madrid did he finally seem to raise his form. While you can never write him off and he started strong this week in Rome, it is a huge question if he can salvage anything out of this season. Even without injuries, absence from competition has always been detrimental to careers of even the greatest athletes in history. No one could ever come back from extended absence and perform like nothing ever happened. Not Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson after jail, not Michael Jordan after a season of baseball, not Federer after knee surgery, or Djokovic after his elbow injury or things that he endured this year. And some never regain their form. But there is always one exception to the rule. Only one man in the history of mankind overcomes his injuries and comes back bigger, faster and younger every time. Only one man's recurring injuries seem to have extended his career instead of cutting it short. Let's hope he donates his body to science. Thank you for watching, say no to drugs and I will talk to you soon.